Today, IWP hosted Dr. Jeffrey Vaughn uh, from Assumption University in order to celebrate Constitution Day. Uh, the event was sponsored for the second year in a row by the Jack Miller Center, a nonprofit organization dedicated to reinvigorating uh, the study of American founding principles and history. Through a variety of initiatives, the Jack Miller Center supports professors and educators across the country who share in their mission. Uh, in fact, over the next two weeks, the Jack Miller Center will be sponsoring 60 events to celebrate Constitution Day. Uh, it also supports the development of academic programs uh, on college campuses. And in fact, this past summer, IWP was named one of its new partners. And with their generosity, IWP will be launching their second undergraduate program next summer. Dr. Vaughn is a professor of political science at Assumption, Assumption University and a visiting fellow at the James Madison Program for American Ideals and Institutions at Princeton. His publications emphasize the modern period from Hobbes to Habermas, but he also is publishing on literature with a forthcoming piece on natural law in the tales of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, he's also writing a book on the philosopher king in modern political thought and a book on the meaning of American citizenship. Uh, with that, please help me welcome Dr. Jeffrey Vaughn. Well, thank you. Thank you, of course, to the Institute of World Politics, um, to Ambassador Vosch, who I met, but she is doing very important things, um, Dr. Lenchowski, uh, and the Jack Miller Center, which supports many initiatives also at Assumption University, including a remarkable uh, model Senate program, which I would happily talk to people about. Uh, we're very pleased with that, and I think the Jack Miller Center is as well. It's a pleasure and an honor to speak here. One of my first students at Assumption University is a graduate of this program, and we have two students currently studying here. So uh, with our art articulation agreement, I feel that IWP is part of the family. Let me say something about Constitution Day the happy occasion for my visit. In 2004, Congress ordered all educational institutions that receive federal funds, which includes any federal student loan or grant, all these institutions, to celebrate the Constitution on or around September 17th of each year. The official title is Constitution Day and Citizenship Day. And in DC, I feel safe that if I say it was passed as part of an omnibus bill, my audience will understand that therefore no one alive fully knows what's in this piece of legislation. The relevant text of the bill is instructive and pertinent to my thoughts tonight. For anyone playing along at home, the relevant portion is 36 code section 106. First, the legislation empowers the president to order that the flag be displayed on federal buildings. I think that's what you call a slow pitch over the plate. I don't, I mean, I'm not sure of any federal buildings that don't fly the flag, but anyway. Second, suitable places are called upon to observe the day with suitable ceremonies. I hope that you will find that I'm suitable, but we'll come back to this. Third, and finally, states, counties, cities, and towns, and by extension, educational institutions, are to provide for, quote, the complete instruction of citizens in their responsibilities and opportunities as citizens of the United States and of the state and locality in which they reside. I am a little nervous about the word complete. How do I provide you with a complete instruction in your responsibilities and opportunities? I'm not sure I've provided anyone a complete instruction in anything, and don't ask my students here if that's true. That word, and the whole line might be good to study as examples of the problems in legislative language. IWP could be in violation of a federal statute tonight if I do not provide a complete education in citizenship. What I mean is that if we take the wording seriously and literally, the bill is commanding something that is obviously impossible. Now, Having introduced my lecture this evening with a close examination of the text of a bill, focusing my concerns on a single word, 
namely complete. I will turn to my stated topic, something that does not appear even once in the text of the Constitution, namely virtue. Civic virtue, like apple pie, is not something one tends to criticize. The ancient Greeks and Romans praised virtue, as did the founders of this nation. The encomia are beautiful, and here are just two examples from George Washington, the first. Virtue or morality is a necessary spring of popular government. From John Adams, public virtue cannot exist in a nation without private, and public virtue is the only foundation of republics. What these statements do not help us understand, however, is what makes civic virtue specifically civic, as opposed to simply being virtuous. Is courage in a political context, for, for instance, somehow different from courage in a personal setting? The answer, as in so many cases, is both yes and no. Sticking for the moment with courage, it is the, it is, it is the same <clears throat> in, uh, insofar as it is the virtue of courage, but it is different insofar as the act of courage may be directed by someone else, a commander, an officer, or some form of official, and not directed by the actor. Conversely, civic virtues will sometimes be demanded by those who are not exercising them. Or will they? Perhaps the commanders exercise different virtues, say prudence, when ordering others to exercise acts of physical courage. This was Aristotle's position. According to him, only a statesman can fully exercise all the virtues. Only the one in command has the opportunity to be virtuous in all respects. On the other hand, he explained that no city can demand all the virtues from all its citizens. Some are appropriate for only some stations in life and at some times. But this simply means the virtues must be understood in context, in this case, their political context. So to understand the civic virtues, we must understand politics. From the very first, those who have reflected upon political life have puzzled over the fact that on the one hand, it provides the greatest scope for action and has the greatest consequences, holding in the balance the lives of thousands and today even millions or billions of people. On the other hand, these opportunities for action are confined to only a few people at any time, leaving the rest of us at the extreme either untouched or as pawns to be moved by others. There have been brief moments in history when the mass of people has been called upon or permitted to exercise more than obedience. Sometimes this, well, this went well, as in the American Revolution. Sometimes not so well, as in the French Revolution and its reign of terror. Unfortunately for our topic, the reign of terror was meant to usher in a republic of virtue. Politics is a dangerous game. Another way to look at politics is to notice that it is not the whole of life. Not every good is a political good. In a letter to his wife, dated the 12th of May, 1780, one of the great statesmen of the founding of this republic, James John Adams, whom I've already quoted, explained that he devoted his life to politics so that their sons and even more their grandsons would not have to do so. He writes, our sons ought to study mathematics and philosophy, geography, natural history, and naval architecture, navigation, commerce, and agriculture, in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture, statuary, tapestry, and porcelain. We know now that John Quincy Adams went on to follow his father into politics, even to the presidency. I'm afraid I do not know the Adams family history as regards tapestry and porcelain. Yet we see here in these sentiments another puzzle, namely that one of the greatest of all political ambitions is to eliminate the need for civic virtue. Adams, it seems, did not want his descendants to have to bother themselves with politics. Are there other endeavors in life where success is measured by eliminating the need for repetition? Baking your finest loaf of bread on a Tuesday does not mean there will be no more need for bread. The perfect triple play does not render future games of baseball superfluous. The problem with John Adams' position in his letter is that it does not do justice 
to his own achievements, nor those of his fellow revolutionaries. It is true that they fought a revolution so their children would not have to do so. They wrote a constitution so their grandchildren could live under its provisions. But they did not do all of these so, there, so that there would be no need for political action ever again. Denying future generations the opportunity for great political action and the exercise of civic virtue would be tyrannical, no matter how just and lasting their achievements might have been. It is also utopian. The utopian temptation seeks to end the need for virtue all at once or in the future. The great tyrannies of the 20th century were guilty of this, but so too were many of the small ones in the 19th century and today. Political life is characterized by tension, not just the tensions we can see in the contest between parties, candidates, and partisans, but by a tension between seeing it as, a, as, as at once the highest of human achievement and at the same time, a bothersome necessity that must be accomplished before the real work of living can be done. We live our political lives when we do live them somewhere in between the two. It is this in-betweenness, if you forgive the word, of human life that I think Aristotle was trying to get at when he wrote that anyone not in need of civic life was either a beast or a god. St. Thomas Aquinas, in his commentary in this passage, agrees, although for him, life above the civic is aromatical, that is, appropriate to holy hermits imbued with divine grace. Either way, what is natural to humans is that we live between the animal part of ourselves and the part that is made in the image of the divine. We can debase ourselves by falling beneath our station and living like animals, but we can also debase ourselves by thinking we have risen above our in-betweenness and have ascended to divinity. History is full of accounts of kings who thought they were gods. In each case, this self-apotheosis was debasing or debauched. There's no account of a self-proclaimed god who was more virtuous as a result. There's a lesson here. St. Augustine, in Book 19 of The City of God, offers a corrective to our rightful praise of virtue. What, he asked, does virtue do other than prevent evil? The virtues are stops against our bad behavior, not spurs to good. Temperance prevents me from the overindulgence I would relish. Courage keeps me from running away. Justice restrains me, or at best corrects a prior injustice. And prudence simply keeps me from making a mistake or at least repeating those mistakes I've already made. This is not his final word on the virtues, of course, civic or otherwise. St. Augustine had a nuanced appreciation for the virtues of the pagan Romans, for instance. His account of Regulus cannot be overlooked. Regulus, having sworn an oath to his captors to return to them, did so over the objections of his people. Augustine uses this as a positive example to Christians, as an instance of real virtue. Nevertheless, his deflation of the virtues in Book 19 is a useful corrective. Even in the fullness of the virtues, we cannot rise above our station as in-between creatures. This is especially true in the case of civic virtue. St. Augustine, in that same part of the City of God, draws out the limits of civic virtue, or more precisely, the virtues in a political context. Consider the case of a judge or a juror. Can either know the facts of the case and the intentions of the accused as well as they might the facts of their lives and their own consciences? Of course not. Even though we are often mysterious to ourselves, as the author of the Confessions certainly knew. Judging ourselves is difficult enough, not only because we have an interest in the outcome. Self-knowledge is a challenge. The difficulty is simply greater when judging another. Are we then to abandon, abandon all judgment? No, he insists, and that is the problem. Justice does not allow us to abandon our duty to render judgment, even when a particular judgment may be unjust. In the same way, 
statesmen and rulers must use prudence, even and especially when their decisions will determine the lives of so many others, precisely because choosing not to act is still to act. There is no escape, and it is most apparent when we rely on virtue in a political context. There, virtue must be discerned and limited in scope, time, and place. Above all, it must be guided by the purpose of civic life, which until recently was understood to be the cultivation of virtue. However, that purpose, cultivating virtue, must be tempered by the means to that end, which is more than just a means, namely the tranquility of order. The tranquility of order, or ordered concord, comes to us from St. Augustine through St. Thomas and much of the natural law tradition. In the words of St. Thomas, for human law's purpose is the temporal tranquility of the state, a purpose which the law attains by coercively prohibiting external acts to the extent that those are evils which can disturb the state's peaceful condition. Notice that this statement begins and ends with peace. Tranquility is the purpose of human law, and the evils which, are, which the law prevents or corrects are those that disturb the state's peaceful condition. This emphasis on tranquility has been criticized for its quietism, that is, for accepting a given political order. Whether rendering unto Caesar or submitting to authority, the gospel tradition is not the revolutionary political movement some people might like it to be. That's not the end of the story. St. Thomas does permit tyrannicide in extreme cases, for instance. More to the point, both St. Thomas's and St. Augustine's comments on the tranquility of order are in the context of restraining political ambitions, specifically the ambition to force people towards virtue. Here again is a tension between civic virtue and virtue simply. Augustine and Thomas both, following Aristotle, argue that the purpose of civic life is to help people develop the virtues. The problem is that law is a blunt instrument and can do more harm than good. The passage they both cite is from Proverbs. He that violently bloweth his nose bringeth, bringeth forth blood. Temperance is a virtue we all hope to develop and most of us should work on, but it makes for a very poor public policy, especially when the policy is itself intemperate. The result of prohibition, as we should remember, was precisely the disturbance of tranquility that law is supposed to guard against, because it did not encourage temperance. Rather, it forced an absolute prohibition upon the citizens without leading anyone to virtue. St. Thomas was clear about the gradual and gentle process of developing virtue, even or especially in a political context. Many have taken the wrong lesson from this part of our history. Too often our experience with prohibition leads people to reject the possibility of prohibiting anything at all. I would not draw that conclusion, nor I think would Augustine or Aquinas. Of course, this libertarian lesson was drawn and taught well before prohibition. Bernard Mandeville's fable of the bees described a system of private vice, or perhaps indifference, that he believed would produce public virtue. Much of our political economy is based on the same idea. Allow people to pursue every possible desire, however base, and all will be happier at the end of the process. No virtue is required by individuals. Instead, virtue emerges out of private interest, like the murmuration of starlings. A republic of vice, or at least a public order of self-interest, is merely the inverse of a republic of virtue. In both, we see a failure to accept that our political life is a condition in between. The modern liberal order tends toward indifference of virtue, although that's complicated. But Augustine and Aquinas were correct to caution against the opposite. Politics may address the greatest topics, but it can never take its subject more than part way to their fulfillment. The temptation is to confuse private virtue with civic virtue, thinking that the political can entirely correct the personal. Elevating civic virtues beyond their capacities, or more exactly, elevating the public means of inculcating virtue beyond those institutional capacities, violates the virtue of prudence 
and justice. But despair is as much of a vice. There are no policies that will bring all people to the fullness of virtue, but instituting a policy of no policies is not better. The first of the civic virtues is to know the limits of civic virtue. In his justly famous essay, known to most of us as simply Federalist 51, James Madison captured the intermediary character of the human condition, which he sought to address, but not eliminate, through the Constitution. He wrote, and I'm sure we could all, almost all say this together, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. We're not wholly virtuous like the angels. I think this leaves great room for the exercise of virtue. And so did Madison. At the Virginia Ratifying Convention, he said, another quote from him, to suppose that any form of government will secure liberty or happiness without any virtue in the people is a chimerical idea. Notice that the author of the Constitution said any form of government, not just a Republican form. Republicanism may call upon our virtues in a particular way, but no form can do without them. Now in his remarkable recent book, Natural Law and Natural Rights Toward a Recovery of Practical Reason, Pierre Menent, the French scholar, describes Martin Luther's ambition in the Reformation as an attempt to escape, quote, the anguished half light, half light of practical life, unquote. The desire to escape this condition is understandable. Yet our practical lives, most especially our political lives, are lived in the twilight, seen as through a glass darkly, to quote Corinthians. To again quote from Menent, the Christian finds himself in the ordinary and common condition of the agent who can do no better than to act in such a way as to have a reasonable hope of achieving his ends. And I would think this goes beyond just Christians. Menent's emphasis on political action, which is all but unavoidable, brings to light features of our civic life that are otherwise obscured. According to Menent, one can act with or without virtue, but demanding one's rights is, in the end, passive. I demand them from someone else, someone else who will act to give them to me. Our modern idea of a person is, first and foremost, someone with rights. Yet this is a passive or theoretical construct. In reality, we act in the world and we bump up against others who act. Only in our imagination or theory do these real human actors have rights. As Edmund Burke put it, their abstract perfection is their practical defect. Menent's argument is too rich to summarize here, but central to it is the fact that in life and politics, we act and our actions have consequences for ourselves and others. That is a perspective lost when we think first of rights, that is, when we think of rights instead of virtues. Perhaps we need an example of action of the person who acts with or without virtue. I suggest we look for just a moment at two failed political leaders from Shakespeare. Duncan in Macbeth is beset by rebellious underlings and assassinated in his sleep by his finest general. Yet Duncan was a gentle ruler, a model of generosity and trustfulness. Macbeth, contemplating the regicide he is about to perform, reflects upon his victim. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculties so meek, hath been so clear in his great office, that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off. These virtues did not protect the king, and they did not avenge him. It is likely they inspired the rebellion that Macbeth was sent to put down in the first place, right at the beginning of the play. 
Duncan's private virtues occasioned rebellion, war, regicide, mass slaughter, and violent death. Even at the end of the play, Banquo's son, prophesied to become king, has not yet reached his station. More violence will come. Duncan's virtues inspired beastly, even subhuman actions among his subjects. Just think of Lady Macbeth's speech. Now, consider Prospero from The Tempest. Prospero's rule in Milan was usurped by his brother because he spent so much time in his study with the liberal arts, so much time that he neglected his political duties. Here's his description of himself to his daughter. And Prospero, the prime duke, being so reputed in dignity and for the liberal arts without a parallel, whose being all my study, the government I cast upon my brother and to my state grew stranger, being transported and wrapped in secret studies. We may often say we would like political leaders with broad learning, but this example shows us why Plato was right. Philosophers have to be compelled to rule. When, when he and Miranda arrived on their desert island, Prospero made himself more than a man and more than a duke. He ruled as a god over the island and its inhabitants, Caliban, Caliban and Ariel, but also his daughter. Only at the end of the play does he return to his proper state as neither a solely private individual nor a godlike sorcerer. As we read in the epilogue to the play, only then does he gain the wisdom to see that he's free. Now, let me draw us back from imaginary republics and principalities to consider the Constitution, the whole point of the exercise today. When I began this talk, and you still held out hope that it would be interesting, I said that the word virtue does not appear in the text of the Constitution, and that's still true. You'll forgive me. Two years of Zoom classes, I assume that when I'm talking, people are off doing other things and they forgot what we said earlier, but you're actually in the room here. So I, this is gonna be the hardest thing to overcome after COVID. So let us just consider for a moment the difference between the omnibus bill that legislated Constitution Day and Citizenship Day, which calls for a complete education in responsibilities and opportunities, and the Constitution itself, which never mentions virtue. Surely the authors of the 2004 legislation never thought anyone would be able to provide a complete education in one day, yet they included the word. Contrarywise, we have ample evidence that the authors of the Constitution of 1787 thought that virtue was entirely necessary for the success of the country they were founding, yet they never mention it. I would argue that the writing of the Constitution was an example of civic virtue, precisely because it did not draw, try to do too much. In the words of the prologue to the Constitution, it secures and promotes. It does not grant or guarantee. I don't think too much can be made of the language. The verbs in order are form, establish, ensure, provide for, promote, secure. It is moderate and measured, even this one moment of rhetorical flourish, to form a more perfect union. In hindsight, to simply form is an understatement. It's a remarkable achievement. The union has survived a civil war, continental expansion, and the elevation of the country to the status of superpower. Now, I don't want to bite the hand that feeds me but contrast this with the legislation that now mandates a celebration of the Constitution. It's ambition unbound. But let me take my own advice and not expect too much from politics or their staffers who write the legislation, whom I see at the back of the room. Virtue perfects the individual, but civic virtue can never perfect political life. If there's a lesson to be learned, it is moderation. Even though Aristotle says all virtue is a mean between excess on either side, the very object of civic virtue must be understood as a mean 
both in its aims and in its ambitions. Our political world today is torn between a debased materialism and indulgence that sees no place for virtue on the one hand, and a despairing idealism on the other, one that losing all confidence in the power of virtue, at least losing confidence in the power it has over other people, seeks through force to overcome the vices of the world and usher in a terrorizing ideal. This is our history. We hope it's not our future. If we are to keep this republic, to paraphrase Benjamin Franklin, we need to seek the moderating influence of civic virtue. The praises to virtue quoted at the beginning of this essay were sincere and they were correct. We can achieve and maintain the dignity of what we are and are meant to be, these in-between creatures, and we can avoid the debasement of succumbing to either extreme only through the use of virtue. Civic virtue requires that we know what is possible and what is not. As we move forward into a brave new world, in Aldous Huxley's sense, not Miranda's, these virtues will be more necessary than ever. Thank you. That's a wonderful question. Um, the, as you, as I'm sure you know, um, the founders were very interested in the history of both Greek democracies and the Roman Republic. The democracies though of Greece, they did not like, precisely because they tended to devolve into um, uh, all of the, the civic vices, right? They, uh, factions tore each other apart. There was little moderation in their ambitions. One might think of the account of the uh, expedition to Syracuse in Thucydides' Peloponnesian War, right? There's this just frantic and frenetic uh, activity within these democracies. The Roman Republic was something different, right? The, in Rome, you, you had this moderating influence of the different uh, stations, the classes, and their institutions. The Senate, which had its censor, so you could only be a member of the Senate if you um, had a certain wealth, but that wealth couldn't be acquired through business. Right? You, couldn't ha you couldn't be a merchant and be in the Senate. If you became wealthy through um, business, you had to sell it all off and buy farmland. And then you could be a member of, of, of the Senate. So there are all sorts of interesting uh, features of Rome that we definitely see, for instance, the Senate uh, in the American Constitution. But they were very taken by it. But so much happens. I think Greece was always held out. I'm trying to think of the phrase that Hamilton uses in the Federalist Papers. Um, not petty tyrannies, but something along those lines. Right? The, 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 those Greek democracies made them nervous. If something was going to last, it couldn't be like those Greek democracies. On the other hand, of course, the Roman Republic didn't last either. Right? We had there. We have Caesar. Cicero tried what he could to maintain the Republic against Caesar, but he couldn't in, um, because there was there, the, the, the Roman Republic didn't have what we call the, um, or we have as, as the competition of institutions, ambition, counteracting ambition. Now, today, what's an issue for today? I think that many people have, have noticed, I'm certainly not the first, I think Yuval Levin uh, would be the finest example of somebody who's noticed this. The institutions do not produce ambitious politicians in one sense. Um, Congress does not protect its 
prerogatives against the judiciary or the executive. If anything, Congress has handed over power to both those parts of, um, if we have the, the first three articles of the Constitution, the three branches of government, Congress, the first branch, supposed to be the most powerful, has handed over so much, many of its powers, to these other two, that um, the, the genius of balancing them against each other, which I think is one of the finest parts of the American Constitution, which precisely you don't see in other constitutions. I mean, ever, the, there's obviously with the death of Queen Elizabeth II and um, now her son Charles III as king, the British Constitution, I hope, is something that people will look, uh, pay a bit of attention to. There is no balance. It's all just hopefulness. Right? There's nothing in the institution. Technically, I think um, Charles as king cannot commit a crime because every crime is against the king. He can't commit crimes. Uh, that's not the balance that we have here. Right? So one of the virtues I think in effect is, in a way, and this is the, the pulling back of virtue, would be considered a vice, ambition, right? It's an ambition that is supposed to counteract ambition. We actually need members of Congress to be more ambitious about the power of Congress, about their body, the legislature, and to pull back some of the powers so that we have a proper balance. Because right now, I mean, if, you know, I don't, I, again, I think if you look at, at our political discourse, it's largely who's on the Supreme Court and who is the president, and the rest of it doesn't really matter. That rest of it being the two bodies that are supposed to be the real center of power. And they might have, some of them might have ambition to be president, but there's no ambition to use the power of Congress itself, or at least there's a great diminishment of that. And I think that's, if anything, I hope that would come back. Well, I think this is, thank you for that. How would I reinvigorate, how would I reinvigorate sure. civic virtue? I think um, it, in keeping with what I said, it's not something that can be mandated in some obscure provision of an omnibus bill. Right? I, as much as I think Constitution Day is important and we ought to venerate the Constitution and, and learn to understand the responsibilities of citizenship, this is precisely the problem that we um, mandate something be taught in a school. We mandate an event. We mandate something else, and yet it is not a part of the living culture. Um, I think that's something that, again, we have several hundred right, senators and members of Congress that could do something. <laughs> um, it would be interesting to see, rather than trolling each other on Twitter, something that would promote civic virtue, talk to each other. A proper debate, not the type of political debate that goes on too often now, but a, a proper exchange of ideas would at least go some way, I think. But to invigorate it throughout the culture, right? That civic virtue is necessary, but it's also not something that can be instituted, ironically, by the civic powers. That's the problem. Parker, the little blue dot is coming. So where would you say is best to find civic virtue? Is it best to find in the national legislature or smaller communities and societies? Um, Tocqueville would have said it was in the smaller communities. What we've seen, and there are different accounts of this process, 
uh, when did this happen, but the nationalization of our politics has made it such that politically engaged people, even the politically engaged, can name their senator, governor, maybe their rep local representative. Very few know local officials or state officials. Again, maybe the governor, but outside of that, it's sort of, um, the loss of local newspapers is a part of this, right? But it's part of the nationalization. And I think this is all a part of a process. Again, when did this happen? The, what's known as the imperial presidency. You get that, when? Does it start after World War II, during World War II? You could say before World War II, with the Great, Great Depression, FDR, but you could push it all the way back to the Civil War, right? And Lincoln, there, there's, there's, there's been a movement, and, and this, for those who want to draw parallels to Roman Republicanism, this is one of the um, things people fear. You can, there's almost a Caesarism slipping into the American Republic with its focus on the president, Ex massive powers given to the president through the administrative state, through um, uh, executive orders, right? Things which I don't know, John Adams, George Washington would not even be able to fathom that the president can issue an executive order to do something that could affect trillions of dollars, right? I mean, so the uh, student loan forgiveness program or plan. Um, this is <laughs> this is like Caesar handing out the latifundia to his troops. Um, so I would like to say that it's in the small communities, the New England townships uh, that Tocqueville identified when he came to America in the early 19th century. But even those are disappearing, right? You can't, um, I have a, a good friend of mine works for our local city in, uh, he's a budget director for public works. You can't get more civic than that, right? Small city public works. Most of what they do has to be in compliance with federal regula regulations so that we, the city of Worcester, where I, I live, had to replace at huge expense its entire water processing facilities, even though it had one of the cleanest, uh, not one of the cleanest water, it had the cleanest, some of the cleanest water in the country. But because of the way it was routed or something, it didn't meet with federal requirements. So the whole thing had to be dug up and replaced. Um, so what's the point of going into local politics when everything gets overruled at the federal level? This is, again, this is something that's happened over the last, certainly the last hundred years in this country. And um, there are, in some cases, very good reasons for it. Right. I, um, the question right now over the strike of the rail workers, that's not something that can be sorted out in Worcester County or some other, you know, that's a national federal issue that has to be worked out at a fed, the federal level. If they go on strike, it's going to be tough for us. Um, the, Bank robber Willie Sutton was asked, why do you rob banks? He said, that's where the money is. Why do people come to DC? That's where the power is, right? I don't have to tell you people. Yes. Kind of piggybacking off this question. Um, James Madison, the Federalist Papers, he talks about how expanded geography is a boon to a republic uh, in that. Um, I, I feel like that applies to what you're saying, in that the idea that bad ideas can't spread as quickly because of how expanded it is. In a world where we have social media that largely circumvents that boon, 
um, and other technologies, how do you feel like you promote and preserve civic virtue when all of these things exist that countervail that? Well, I, look, the, the intervention of, of uh, social media is something that is almost impossible to measure, right? Because every time there is, right? So what's the influence of Facebook? Well, who cares, right? Kids aren't using Facebook anymore. They're onto something else. As soon as we discover what it is that people are using, they're not using it anymore. Right? So it moves so quickly. But uh, I was speaking to the ambassador before uh, my talk this evening, and she was saying she's very concerned about this because not only we're all we're all you know, looking at our phones. Um, but for exactly this thing, these ideas rush through. So I don't know how we're supposed to respond to this, but I hope somebody's starting to think about it because if Madison is right, and I tend to think he is, right? They expand the Republic, you expand the factions, you have overlapping factions. So we might agree on one thing and disagree on something else and we'd agree. So I don't side with you 100% or you with 100%, right? The idea is that you don't form any permanent factions where we're, I'm always with you and I'm always against somebody else. I'm kind of back and forth with you. That's ideal, right? Um, could, we, could that happen in social media? I don't know that it couldn't. I'm not sure that it does, and I don't know why. I'm the last person you would want to ask about social media, so I, I don't know how it could be, but I don't, I don't understand why it would necessarily have to undo the solution of the extended republic. I don't know. Uh, I'll ask a quick question, I guess. Um, so you had mentioned at the beginning of your talk, uh, the purpose of politics is to allow people to act, to be virtuous. Uh, and then you proceeded to talk more about the necessity of virtue in maintaining a republic. Hmm. Uh, these are two different ways of thinking about virtue. One of them is instrumental and one of them is not. Uh, at the end of the day, which, which founding fathers leaned which way? Which leaned which way? Um, God, never tried to line them up uh, along these, uh, this line. Or pick one who really did consider virtue an end and one that considered it really just a necessary means for the sake of the world. Well, I, okay, so let's take the extremes. I think Washington obviously thought virtue was an end in itself. Right, from his, a young age, he has this uh, uh, whole system of developing virtues. Right? Franklin will set aside. Um, Jefferson, on the other hand, probably thought it was instrumental. Right now, what I'm trying to think through in this talk and my own efforts on this subject is, and I'm trying to get that get towards it in the sense of being in between, that in a way, you have to think of it as both, right? Um, raising children, virtue is an end, but it can only be that end if for at least the first 25 years, <laughs> Okay, maybe not that long. It's simply instrumental, right? I mean, you have to, you, we need you to do this. You need to learn how to do these things. And then it becomes habitual. But more than that, it becomes really life giving, right? Um, virtue is both instrumental 
and an end in itself, which makes it this very weird thing that, that I, th I think is, is part of um, the problem in trying to inculcate virtue and to think about civic virtue, because yes, on the one hand, it's purely instrumental. If we can't do this, the whole thing falls apart. There's blood in the streets. There's, I mean, the, we don't want to go through the collapse of Rome, right? I, I hope. Um, on the other hand, it's not simply to prevent mass uprisings and another civil war or something like that, that one would um, promote virtue. It is a good in itself. And it is, as a teacher, it's something wonderful to see. These, you know, kids who come in, come to me at 17 who think they're all so clever. And guess what? Years later, they really are. They weren't then. <laughs> right? But, but they, and it's not just instrumental. Oh boy, I hope they're going to write, a, you know, those staffers will write a law that will be a good law. It's just good to see. It's just good to see these people fulfilled. Yes. Do you have the... Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm curious that um, the Supreme Court, when they're, when they're interpreting the Constitution, and they have different sides, whether it be the living guy or the original interpretation, how do they view, how does virtue in their eyes differ from those, from those perspectives? So that, that's a great question. Um, I'm not an expert on the Supreme Court. I think it's a fascinating body. Um, and I think that question gets to, maybe I'm gonna steal this idea and start thinking about this more because I think that this actually does get to an, an interesting question in the debate between originalism, living constitution, right? Um, one of the criticisms of originalism, I mean, it's, so, so let me back up, let's say, Living constitutionalism, right, that you can read into the document, it's sort of moving through time. On the one hand, that is much easier to understand with an account of virtue, right? We've discovered something new, this is a new right, this is a new good, this is, so we need to just use the constitution, interpret it as we may, to find, to get that result. Right? Originalism and a lot of the criticisms on the right, so uh, Hadley Arcus, here in DC, um, this is uh, an exchange with Bork and Scalia. There's in this has come up in the last many times. One of the criticisms of originalism is that it is simply reading an instruction manual, and it relies entirely on the virtue, if you want to put it in terms of virtue, of the legislators who wrote that law, right? So he's like, look, slave owners wrote this law. It can't be good. The originalist doesn't say, okay, change it, right? Congress, write a new law. Um, I think the Lawrence v. Texas, uh, case. Anybody remember that? There's, there's, uh, there was a, a law in Texas that banned um, homosexual sex, just banned it, right? It was illegal. It was, nobody was brought up on charges, right? And um, Justice Thomas voted against it being overturned. He wanted to up uphold it. His position is, change the law. Just rewrite your, rewrite your law. You can do it. Don't ask us to do it in the um, Supreme Court. Now, I would think that I like that idea. Get the legislature to do its job, right? Um, but I think an awful lot of people are concerned, and rightfully so, that it doesn't do its job. But in seeing that, then they jump, well, let's get the Supreme Court to do it which it's often ready to do because in some cases things 
really just, this doesn't work, right? Um, but again, where's the ambition of Congress to step up? I, the number of times I've heard, well, there's the famous, we have uh, Nancy Pelosi, we have to pass the law to see what's in it. But also we have to pass the law and let the court decide what its limits are. Well, that's an abrogation of authority. You're, you're supposed to decide that, right? You're supposed to set that out in the law. And that's precisely what they don't do. Um, so, so then I, th I think that's, that's one of the reasons why the Supreme Court has become so much more important in the last 100 years. And the, if, again, if you look at the um, confirmation battles, most Supreme Court justices were confirmed almost unanimously up through the 70s, and then boom, you get hit with Bork. And then it was, you know, several of them uh, after that were still, I think it was 97 to one for um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? But then it starts to get really much more partisan as people start to see, depend, you know, it entirely depends who's there because, you know, all that, in a way, all that Congress does anymore, it's not all, but most, much of it is simply approving Supreme Court justices. And that's where the real politics of the country is gonna get done. So that's, I think, problematic. I think that um, it's not good for the health of, of the Republic. And I think in terms of civic virtue, it's offloading everything onto one small group of people. Nine. Any final questions? What? All right, well, thank you again, Dr. Vaughn. Thank you.